but I am so inspired by your story. And I will start right directly to the core of, of, of my main question is we've seen for years and years regimes using technology to protect their authoritarianism. Mm -hmm. For the first time in my life, I see a leader like you yourself who is using technology to protect democracy and advance democracy. Mm -hmm. So how did, you, how did this journey in you embracing technology as, as a, an, a fundamental tool to make democracy a perfect, to make democracy even a more perfect system and more transparent system. Mm -hmm. Certainly, uh, and it started with journalism. Uh, both of my parents are journalists, uh, working uh, from, I had memory, maybe 85 and so, uh, they're already uh, working as frontline journalists uh, covering uh, Taiwan's democratization. You see, at that time, Taiwan is very much a authoritarian society. Um, we're still under martial law at that point, uh, even though it will be lifted pretty quickly uh, around the uh, end of the 80s. Um, and so their work uh, was, I guess, interfered right? uh, by the kind of political uh, censorship and so on. Uh, and my dad uh, would eventually, uh, in 1989, uh, visit the Tiananmen Square around May and June. Uh, and you know what happened uh, there. Yeah. Uh, and fortunately for our family, uh, he returned to Taiwan on the 1st of June. Um, and uh, we've seen how technology um, shaped that particular movement, how the first use uh, for journalism, digital camera and digital transmission, uh, how the real-time uh, or at least semi-real-time broadcasting uh, shaped the international conversations, uh, how the images such as someone stopping uh, the tanks and so on uh, shaped the international reactions uh, to that event and so on. So my dad was so um, motivated uh, by that experience he would then uh, move to Germany uh, for a few years. Uh, also, was there to cover the wall, uh, the Berlin Wall, uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, as well as uh, completing uh, his uh, studies uh, at uh, Sachland University, studying on the dynamics of how such modern um, social technologies of organization uh, shaped the Tiananmen uh, movement. Uh, interviewing uh, many people who have fled Beijing uh, and visited. Uh, Germany and France, and uh, I remember meeting them uh, in our living room, and they're they're still very young. They're like in their early twenties, still studying, uh, but they feel very passionately about the possibility of, especially communication technology and how it could advance democratization. So I would say it, it started very uh, early in my life. Amazing. So your generation is the first generation mm -hmm. to live uh, post that era of authoritarianism in a in a in a in a. Mm -hmm. where you have free speech, you have access to technology, mm -hmm. so you can see the possibilities. Mm -hmm. But what is against you is actually regimes mm -hmm. that are using this technology for more surveillance, more oppression. I mean, mm -hmm. one of my friends was Jamal Khashoggi, mm -hmm. who, who's the regime killed him mm -hmm. through, mm -hmm. the, through technology. They, mm -hmm. they bought Pegasus, they mm -hmm. spied on his phone, yep. they, they hunted him, captured yep. him. So what you are up against is mm -hmm. powerful regimes uh, what are the, you know, how can technology actually counter these regimes? How do you think we can together counter and, and win? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I believe uh, that journalism, uh, just like how public health as a profession is our counter against the virus of the mind, I believe journalism, that is to say, uh, the art and uh, craft uh, of getting the truth out uh, to the public in a way that public comprehends uh, with perspectives, with investigation, and so on, should itself be democratized. That is to say, um, anyone should, uh, in Taiwan at least, we strive uh, for our basic education to include what we call media competence, not just media literacy. You see, literacy is when you're a consumer of media, of narratives, of stories, of flowcharts and statistics, uh, but competence uh, is when you are a producer, uh, you are someone in the field and you can um, actually make your own narrative, uh, even if uh, you are one of the most disadvantaged uh, group in the front line, uh, competence enable you to amplify the story so that more people who care about this cause uh, can join together and uh, highlight the inequality, the injustice and so on. So, which is why uh, in Taiwan, um, 
after we've seen that the foreign interference, propaganda, and so on, they're not trying to advance one cause or the other. Uh, rather, they're trying to destabilize people's trust in democracy, in the democratic yeah. process. Uh, what they're ultimately after uh, is to shape their narrative so that uh, people would prefer, actually, to live under authoritarian rule uh, because it's more effective or um, it has a uh, longer um, time span for, for caring or whatever, right? Uh, so, so they have their, their narratives. And the best way to counter those narratives uh, in our experience is so that uh, the people can actually join democratic process before, way before they're 18. Uh, the primary schoolers, if they can measure air quality and inform their family whether they should go out for a walk or drive, uh, if the air pollution level, uh, participate in distributed ledgers and data stewardship, if the middle schoolers can fact check the three presidential candidates in real time, uh, so that during their debate and their forum, uh, if they say something that's against the facts, uh, the middle schoolers' name uh, and their contribution uh, appear on public uh, television and streaming and so on, uh, then that increases the bandwidth of democracy of people's input and also reduce the latency, the time delay before someone uh, who surface an injustice uh, into someone thinking of an innovation to address that. And then the entire society thought, oh yeah, we can actually make something better together. And that's in my uh, knowledge, in my experience, is the best defense against the authoritarian narrative. So you want participation, mass participation at a very young age, engagement, listening, and you're talking about active involvement, meaning holding these people in power accountable mm -hmm. through transparency. Yep. Yes, exactly. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, there's, a, there's something that I, while I was preparing for this interview, mm -hmm. I saw that you pointed out to multiple things. And one of the things that I love and you pointed out to is other movements around the world. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you're not only a, a Taiwanese leader. Mm -hmm. At this point, you're a global leader. Mm -hmm. um, and, sorry. Sure. Oh, sorry. What, Oh my God, I don't know what happened here. Apologies. Oh, that, that's pretty so good music. Out to Wall Street, mm -hmm. uh, I, I want to show you three movement, global movement sure. that did not succeed, mm -hmm. but inspired the world. Wall Street, Occupy Wall Street 2010, Arab Spring 2011, mm -hmm. where a million of people rose up demanding democracy, dignity, and global change, and more representation. And then you have 2011, the anti-austerity movement yep. in Europe. Yep. And then we have the sunflower mu movement, mm -hmm. which is maybe the only movement in my lifetime that really succeeded. Mm -hmm. Why do you think these other movements failed versus yours that succeeded? Yeah, I, I think the main difference uh, really is in the uh, situational applications, the sit-ups. Uh, that we co-created during the Sunflower Movement, learning fully uh, from the scholars such as Manuel Castell, who analyzed very deeply uh, why these previous movements did not reach uh, its original goal. Uh, and um, in these movements uh, that we have studied, uh, what, what people have uh, expressed uh, really is a kind of outrage, but uh, uh, energy that is the outrage could not reliably turn into co-creation or to uh, good enough consensus. Uh, that half a million people on the street uh, would readily agree on. Indeed, as time go goes on, uh, there's disinformation, there's rumors, there's violence, escalation, and so on, uh, that turned the initial uh, utterly uh, nonviolent uh, movement into something that uh, even the organizers themselves uh, could not um, converge on any um, coherent demands, right? Uh, uh, of course, for, for some people, that was the point, right? That was the point of um, exposing um, the, the way that the powers work and uh, um, the, how the structure work and the structurelessness uh, to them is a feature, it's not a bug. Uh, but uh, in the Sunflower Movement, because the Occupy was very specific, people occupy the parliament uh, to deliberate, to demonstrate the cross-trade service and trade agreement. So from the very beginning uh, to three weeks after what, where the Occupy, as you said, was a triumph, uh, people focused um, on the good enough consensus that the society could agree on, on all aspects of the CSSTA. And here technology, social technology enters play because it allows us to uh, distill uh, the CSSTA into just the aspect that affects the individual going on the street. If you uh, work in a particular thread, for example, if you're a journalist, uh, we have tools that can show you uh, how exactly would CSSTA affect the publishing industry and the journalism uh, business uh, and the sector, right? So uh, you can then deliberate on the part that you 
you feel comfortable deliberating about. Of course, you can still uh, go into other places uh, around the occupied parliament and, for example, listen uh, into how people deliberated of our 4G infrastructure and how so-called private sector from the Beijing regime, uh, if we allow them into the core uh, infrastructure of communication, what will happen from the separate security measure and so on. So it allowed cross-pollination in a kind of learning uh, society, but it also most crucially allowed people who uh, know actually from their first-hand experience about the things that were deliberate about not be sidetracked uh, into polarization, uh, into hate speech, uh, into attacking each other and so on, and focus on demonstration as in demo on how actually we can look at CSSTA and to make coherent points uh, that would then eventually be adopted by the head of the parliament. Audrey, you are the first uh, Minister of Technology, mm -hmm. and this is the first time in our lifetime actually we use technology as a fundamental tool. It's been used as a weapon for a long time, but now it's really a tool. So in this, I would like to understand your vision for the future for this digital world. Mm -hmm. You know, post, I'm not sure I can call it post-COVID, but during COVID, we learn how to our entire life functioned around technology. Mm -hmm. We don't need to travel anymore. We can do everything through technology and via technology. But from that, you know, from that, we can see, uh, we, I, I don't think the world still can assemble a true vision around what is a future technological digital world. In your view, what is that world would look like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, as uh, Taiwan's first digital minister, uh, I outlined my job description uh, and my vision, if you would, uh, in a prayer, uh, in a poem, uh, when I first became digital minister in 2016. Uh, and it's very short, so I might as well recite Please. it first. Yeah, it goes like this. Uh, when we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is near, let's always remember the plurality is here. So plurality, I believe, is the vision uh, that I have. But not just me, right? It's uh, pretty much everyone who don't want their values to be hijacked by technology, who want technology to adapt to the societal norms, to the communities that we already trust. So very often you talk about we, mm -hmm. and, and most leaders talk about, most leaders I interviewed are I, 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 mm -hmm. ego, ego, ego. Mm -hmm. You're talking about the collective human effort, mm -hmm. a yes. collective union. Mm -hmm. And that's what I read in the poem. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you where this came from? Uh -huh. I think uh, one of the uh, very influences um, uh, of our family, really, um, is Taiwan's uh, transcultural uh, background. Uh, in my family, people speak uh, different languages. Uh, my father's uh, father came from Sichuan, speaking Sichuanese, uh, and my father's mother uh, is, speaks Holok, Taiwanese, uh, Daigi, uh, and um, actually Japanese quite fluently, uh, and so on. So um, it's a story of people who uh, don't readily converse with each other. Uh, they, of course, they share the kanji, uh, writing the ideographic characters so they can, I don't know, send love letters to one another. Uh, but, but the point here is that they come from very different backgrounds, uh, very, very different cultures, indeed in World War II, in different sides of the war. Uh, and that, uh, I think, it defines more than anything uh, the Taiwanese capability to look at ideological rifts and gaps and so on, and then build a, a, a we, a, a common ground around, for example, democratic practice uh, and uh, contribution uh, to the, the world's sustainability and prosperity. And so as the common values, despite very, very different ideological and ethnic and cultural backgrounds uh, that's in the society we have, 20 national languages, more than 16 of which indigenous. Uh, and so I think this is uh, my background uh, as being raised in Taiwan uh, from families that come from four very different places in the world and speaking various different languages. So you, you talked very often about reaching consensus, quicker, faster. Mm -hmm. So we live in a mm -hmm. polarized world mm -hmm. where nation within nations, there is a deep rift ideological, racial, social, and it seems like the forces of regimes are are actually pointing out to those weaknesses 
to undermine the nations from within. So you're telling me that in Taiwan, you are strengthening your nation through the process of, of consolidating and validating and celebrating these diversities and creating better consensus. Is that where technology plays a role? Yes. Uh, the very beginning of the internet centers around this fundamental idea of rough consensus or good enough consensus or consensus that we can live with. Right, so it, it's not perfect. It's not in the sense that everyone signed an agreement, a contract, a treaty, or things like that. It's this broad um, values that people agree to honor despite their differences in achieving those values. Uh, and I believe this vision, the inter in internet, uh, is what allowed the internet to talk to people to various um, different jurisdictions, different backgrounds, and so on, because people want to be connected to other people who share their feelings, uh, who can understand each other's situation, despite that we're raised in different places on earth and so on. So this um, rough consensus of connectivity, not just connectivity of machines, but of uh, human communities to human communities, powers the early internet. And that's what convinced uh, the pretty monolithic, uh, pretty hierarchical, pretty close silos of local telecommunication carriers and so on to eventually become uh, a global internet. So I do believe that this is not just Taiwan, but rather anywhere the internet touches uh, the internet working protocol, uh, it imbues in itself this idea of good enough consensus of steering toward common values and the innovations that can amplify those values. So Audrey, how did entry into politics mm -hmm. materialize? Mm -hmm. uh, you came from the private sector. I mm -hmm. mean, you, you, you built basically a career in that direction. Mm -hmm. When did you decide to enter into politics and what was the driver? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say I come from uh, the social sector at a time that I entered the cabinet uh, in 2016. Right? I'm, of course, still an um, independent contractor, consultant uh, to many large uh, companies, but most of my time is already uh, part of the social sector or the civil society or the voluntary sector, many different names. Right? Uh, the, the social sector uh, in Taiwan actually have uh, slightly higher legitimacy than the public sector and definitely the private sector uh, for most of my life. Uh, that was partly because uh, the public sector would not start democratization um, you know, before the lifting of the martial law, but even during the martial law era, uh, still the local charities, the co-ops, especially consumer co-ops, uh, are already striving. So people uh, get their taste on democracy, on voting the leaders, uh, not voting for president, which would not happen until 96, uh, but voting for their local co-op chapter leader or things like that. And so this community building movement, and especially that we have lots of earthquakes and natural disasters, typhoons and so on, so in the recovery uh, and the resilience against such natural disasters, build the social solidarity despite uh, people in those charities having very different religions, for example, but they still work very uh, closely together in order to rebuild uh, after an earthquake and ameliorate uh, their uh, impact, negative impact on the community uh, that they care. So when I say that I come from the social sector, I mean specifically the G0V or Gov0 movement, uh, which looks at the not-for-profit, purpose-oriented sector, and then look at uh, digital services uh, from our government that did not answer the need of those sectors. Uh, my first project in uh, 2013 uh, was um, just people who want to uh, learn Mandarin or Daiyi or any of those um, languages. Uh, and then they found that the Ministry of Education is very siloed. Those uh, languages are kept in different websites. And the website said, uh, uh, you know, all copyright res uh, reserved. You can't really redistribute that. But the problem is that the website uh, does not actually uh, catch up with mobile web, so you can't really use it with a phone, uh, and then you can't easily share whatever you've looked up and so on. So this very real need uh, by the teachers who want to teach um, whatever language they want to teach to the children uh, is not answered by the Ministry of Education. But instead of going on the street to protest, we instead uh, just um, copied uh, everything uh, and 
and then we say uh, we're not violating the copyright is fair use because we're not saying that we profit from it so we do it entirely voluntarily and then we crowdsource we ask everyone uh, students and teachers to point out the mistakes the typos and so on in the national language database within those um, dictionaries so we're also contributing uh, to the, the culture and uh, the newest um, ideas and words that did not get encoded into the Taiwanese uh, dictionary the Daiki we also crowdsource that like urban dictionary uh, from the uh, people who care about that language and so on so what I'm trying to say is that the social sector can fill in uh, the public sector's um, gaps and when we're doing that we're very much doing politics it's just not politics in the cabinet or in the legislature. It is politics as in um, getting people together, crowdsourcing their energies and improving the welfare, the, the public good. Uh, so I took those ideas and then I joined the cabinet, uh, I think because, well, people have seen how those technologies, those pro-social social media can play a part uh, in the Sunflower Occupy in getting the good enough consensus. So it's not just making dictionary together, it could also be making uh, treaties uh, together this crowdsourcing has broad applications so at the end of 2014 uh, I was recruited as a reverse mentor as a young advisor uh, to cabinet minister and two years after uh, I guess I got promoted from an intern to a full-time still in the office uh, of the minister uh, Audrey that's inspiring it went very fast and and clearly your activism became crucial to, to you know, also the new, le le legitimacy of the, this new government mm -hmm. post the revolution. Mm -hmm. I want to read you a data and I was looking at it and it's, it's 2019 mm -hmm. and 20% of Hong Kong's population, population of 7.4 million people protested, mm -hmm. went to the street. Mm -hmm. By proportion, these are the largest protests in modern history mm -hmm. in any nation. Mm -hmm. It's not the end game, obviously, because Hong Kong government and Beijing government managed to turn a whole generation of students from citizens to dissidents. Many of you, them are in Taiwan now. And exactly. Mm -hmm. You did the reverse. Mm -hmm. You protested. Those citizens who were very angry became even more active citizens. Can we say that? Yes, definitely. And that is the difference uh, between a democratic regime and an authoritarian regime. So they turned their citizen into dissidents. And what we see now in Ukraine and other period, they're turning groups of people, like trying to erase the identity of these people. How can we uh, look at Taiwan as a successful model? How can we implement or any of the advice of how can some of your steps that are, you are implementing to better your democracy can be implemented and can become global? Well, I don't have much of an ego even in the name Taiwan. I was just uh, talking to um, the new local uh, conference, public servants and social sector people from the UK. Uh, and I said, you know, if you think Taiwan is too unique, too strange uh, in counter pandemic, just call it the New Zealand model. Uh, because New Zealand <laughs> adapted the Taiwan playbook in countering the pandemic. Uh, so, so it doesn't really need to be called uh, the Taiwan model. That, that said, uh, I think uh, there's a couple of things that are broadly applicable. The first thing uh, is just trusting your fellow citizens. Uh, in liberal democracies, many people in the career public service see 5,000 counter signature, 50,000 counter signatures, and, and then they immediately think of pressure, right? Uh, that these people are here to make demands, to hold us accountable, uh, and so on. But the beauty of digital technology uh, is that it's no longer one way. Uh, if all you have is radio and television, then of course your citizens can only protest and cannot really uh, during their way of protest to demonstrate a better way of doing things. But because the internet is symmetrical, so you can actually make a very fair uh, counter question to the protesters. Uh, and that's what we do. And we say, okay, so you call our counter pandemic mass distribution as biased. Uh, it's probably biased. Uh, we initially thought that the pharmacies where we distribute align perfectly with population centers, which is true. But uh, as you pointed out by the opposition party and the uh, uh, protesters, uh, not everyone own a helicopter. <laughs> so the same distance on the map doesn't mean anything when the rural areas, people have to wait for an hour to take a bus. So by the time they got into those distribution points, uh, they're already uh, you know, done for the day, right? So uh, we're being deeply 
unequal while the numbers look somewhat equal uh, and so it's our fault but say if we only say that uh, it doesn't really improve the, the matter because we don't actually know how to do better but because we trust the citizens we publish every 30 seconds like a distributed ledger the real-time inventory so the protesters the counter expertise know exactly the same data as we do and so the fair question would then be asked and our minister did ask so legislator teach us you are, uh, you were VP of data analytics at Foxconn. You you should actually lecture us on how to make the distribution more fair. And that's what she did. Uh, and then 24 hours afterward, we implemented a much more fair rationing way. And we also introduced uh, pre-registration and so on by popular demand. Now, nothing about this is magical or Taiwan specific. Any government, any jurisdiction at any level, even local governments can publish real-time data uh, evidence uh, if it's not about privacy or trade secret, which is a lot. Actually, most of it is not around privacy and trade secret. Uh, and then ask the people, how would you do better if you are in the digital minister's place? So that's the first thing I would advise everyone to do, <laughs> to trust your citizens. And the second thing, of course, uh, is also uh, to amplify those innovations by reducing the latency. Um, every week, I hold office hours so to amplify the best ideas from the social innovators to the entire country and beyond. Um, in the counter pandemic every 24 hours at 2 p.m. every day, uh, the Center for Epidemic uh, Command Center uh, broadcasted and uh, actually answered questions from all the journalists until they run out of questions uh, so that we can actually amplify the innovation that happened in the past 24 hours again into national awareness. So the other thing you can do is to reduce the latency of democracy. So improve the bandwidth by trusting the citizens and then reduce the latency by responding faster in the here and now. I love, I love also what you did, did to counter basically the pressure from China mm -hmm. to exclude and, mm -hmm. and erase Taiwan, mm -hmm. especially from the, the consciences of the international community. Mm -hmm. You advise your government mm -hmm. to participate at international meetings, UN mm -hmm. meetings and other meetings digitally mm -hmm. combined with some kind of diplomacy. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's brilliant because during COVID, everything went digital, everything went online. Mm -hmm. So you were ahead of your time to mm -hmm. bypass censorship and pressure from government. Yeah, uh, when, when I did that, I think the first time that the media became aware uh, is in the Internet Governance Forum in the UN Geneva building uh, in 2017. Uh, actually, I was doing that for quite some time, uh, but because the three IGF, years before the pandemic, yes. three years before COVID. Well, I, I, I did that in 2015, 16 too. But anyway, in, in 2017, because that UN meeting was live streamed because it's Internet Governance Forum, um, well, they, they can't really erase the, the live streaming or the recording. Uh, so it became a popular um, knowledge. And uh, the, the main reason why uh, they would uh, previously been successful in excluding me is actually on a, a technicality uh, because to enter a UN building or, or whatever building that is hosting a UN conference, you have to present uh, a passport uh, that belongs to one of the UN member uh, states, uh, member nations. Uh, and because we're not um, at the moment, we used to be uh, a founding member, uh, so we're not yet a, a nation uh, within the UN, uh, so I could not enter the passport. But on the other hand, a robot need to know passport. A robot is just a piece of machine. Uh, and then the meeting was just watching a, a movie, I guess, together, uh, even though the movie was recorded just half a second ago uh, from Taiwan, right? Uh, that's me. So uh, I think this avatar of sorts, uh, although the PRC regimes uh, um, delegates protested, they actually did not leave the room. So that sets the precedent, because previously, if their protest was not successful, they have to leave the room, because otherwise it's dual representation. Uh, but I guess it sets a new norm that it's not representation, if it's just a representation, <laughs> right, uh, of like a TV or something. Uh, and so that enabled me to attend much more uh, meetings that is affiliated by the UN uh, in the coming years. Uh this is really brilliant, I must say, like way before you bypassed all kind of these censorship and blockage. Mm -hmm. um, there's one thing that, I, I'm, you know, um, you talked about majority rule mm -hmm. in democracy mm -hmm. and also how to find ways for minority to exercise their influence. Mm -hmm. and, and we see around the world how minorities are, are you know, whether they are segregated, crushed, demonized, criminalized. How can minorities take an example from what you are doing to Taiwan and 
some of the examples of your movement mm -hmm. uh, for social justice, for global justice. What do you think the lesson number one? I mean, I live in the United States. We had all kind of, you know, protests connected to minorities, whether women, you know, the women march mm -hmm. or or Black Lives Matter and any other minorities. What do you advise them mm -hmm. to do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think having a safe space where you can form movement around globally people who are in your place, uh, in their own jurisdictions. That's very important. Look at the climate movement. It started uh, from people who would be adversely affected by climate change. Maybe they live in such habitats, uh, but because their jurisdiction has a large land mass, maybe they do not get a sufficient amount of votes uh, so, so that yes. the, the, the uh, legislators care, right? But what they did is that they bonded together. I attended some of their summits, uh, again, uh, through video conference because we don't want to cause uh, carbon emissions. Uh, and then each island uh, sends their own representative. So uh, from the, our, our country, um, Taiwan and Penghu <laughs> is actually two people. Uh, and, and that's a, a very different view, right? Because if you just uh, vote uh, within our jurisdiction, uh, then the population of Penghu is dwarfed uh, by the population in Taiwan. Uh, but if you say uh, each island, indeed each habitat that suffers from climate change uh, must have their voices heard, uh, and uh, smaller islands like Tuvalu and so on, uh, they because the emergency is higher for them, they deserve higher place uh, on the agenda. Then that flips the agenda setting power. Uh, the closest uh, people closest to the pain, uh, they must have the higher agenda setting power in such safe spaces and movements. So the internet provides new mechanisms uh, to reconfigure democracy so that it's prioritized not by whether you're 18 years old or, or things like that, but rather prioritize, as I mentioned during the Sunflower Occupy, uh, how adversely you would be affected by the CSSTA. And the more adversely you will be affected, you will be given more voice. And so my suggestion is just to form such spaces, pro-social, social media, the civic infrastructure on the digital realm, and then um, organize. Well, that's probably the, the one call to action to organize globally. Organize globally, beautiful. We're seeing, for example, now with the war with Ukraine, how a smaller country, uh, less militarized, actually winning uh, in the court of the public opinion, because of social media, because of technology, mm -hmm. because of the exposés of everything the other side is doing. Mm -hmm. and, and But also we're seeing here in the United States an aggressive movement against minorities, especially the LGBTQ, mm -hmm. laws after laws after laws to, I mean, in Florida where I teach, I mean, the governor said, you're not even allowed to say that you're gay or transgender. Mm -hmm. You're not even allowed to say it. Mm -hmm. You decided to, as gender, to put, mm -hmm. if I am not wrong, uh, if my- Whatever, that, that's my gender. Yeah, yeah whatever, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was seen by the young people as an mm -hmm. act of, revolu as, as, as a brilliant act of non-binary. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I don't want the world to define me. Mm -hmm. I want to be what I am, what mm -hmm. I want to be. How can you reconcile that with what's happening around the world globally mm -hmm. in terms of real bigotry and oppression? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I have to turn off that alarm thing. Uh, I, I don't have anything else, but I have to turn, turn off that. Just a second. Of course. And we're back. Um, sorry for Welcome back. The, distracting <laughs> the, the flow. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. It's just, mm -hmm. I would like to, if, if you feel comfortable about mm -hmm. your personal um, mm -hmm you know, identification, but also about how, you know, what's happening around us globally when it comes to our identities, whether it's a racial, religious, uh, whether we belong to minority or not, or even sexual identities, mm -hmm. and how there's a wave of conservatism that is waging a war on all of us mm -hmm. in the name of, like, that we, we, we have to be part of their, their, their world that is constructed you know, that is either mm -hmm. black or white. That is defined uh, by uh, existing institutional labels. Exactly. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, first of all, I, I do use those labels, uh, but I don't use it in a way that associates my identity with it. I would say, for example, that I experienced um, a male puberty uh, when I was 13, 14 years old. 
And that's when I discovered that my development uh, path uh, isn't quite the same uh, with other boys. Um, and uh, later on, I would get my this testosterone level uh, measured, uh, and I'm somewhere between uh, an average human male and an average human female. Anyway, um, and then uh, I would say I had another puberty uh, for a couple of years when I was 24, 25, um, the female puberty uh, and uh, through hormonal replacement. Um, and so on. So, so I, I would not, uh, as you have seen, I have not actually said that I was something and I became something, I identify as something. I said I had this experience and then I discovered that and then I had another experience and so on. And, and this difference uh, is intentional because this is the intersectional way of talking about those uh, this labels. This is like, I, okay, I learned English, then I moved, and so I spoke uh, Dagi or Mandarin for a couple of years, and then I moved back, and I then uh, spoke English too, but nowadays I speak Mandarin to these people, and, and so on, right? So, so th this point is uh, that uh, I don't have in my mind this labeling effect where half a population is closer to me and half population is farther away from me, uh, or that half of population is my people and half of population is not my people, uh, and so on. I, I'm like, um, I, I take all the sides, and there are people who I don't yet have a lot of shared experience with, but that's my problem, and I can always spend some time on a, um, just hanging out really, uh, spending time together uh, so that I can also see the world from their experience because I can experience more experiences than I have uh, already experienced. Right? So I, I think this is a um, um, positive uh, way of looking at those labels in that they're not mutually exclusive, uh, they're like hashtags, and we're not constrained uh, how many hashtags that we can uh, experience. And I do believe uh, that this uh, both conserves uh, the existing labels, which of course unites community together, but stays open so that new hashtags may form uh, and old hashtags cannot cancel uh, new hashtags. So how do you cope, if I may humbly mm -hmm. suggest, with this wave of conservatives and, and macho, mm -hmm. you know, way of trying to impose or try to create fear and, and suspicion around people who don't want to be identified with mm -hmm. all stereotypes. Mm -hmm. Well, How I, do we I think it's well it's it's not a a projection of strength. It's a projection, psychological projection uh, of insecurity, of vulnerability, right, uh, from the people uh, who want uh, their identities to matter. Uh, there, if they identify as as macho or, or, or conservative. What, what they're feeling is that um, their kind of once secure um, ideas uh, are being being modeled, canceled, confused, and so on. Uh, and so they project uh, this um, insecurity into, I guess, acting out, uh, and then create uh, a more more um, kind of violent uh, conversation uh, around such such matters. And uh, uh, and and the thing is, um, I, I actually take all the sides, so I also take their side. Uh, I, I'm like, um, so when Taiwan passed marriage equality, uh, we didn't actually redefine the civil code uh, or reinterpret through constitutional interpretation the way that many jurisdictions did. We actually invented a new relationship. Uh, and then this new rela relationship is um, a wedding between two um, like um, homosexual uh, individuals or people who um, identify as such or whatever. Uh, and uh, when they are wed this way, their families don't. So unlike the civil code, where the kinship uh, relationships is formed uh, through the heterosexual marriage lineage, um, this new uh, relationship uh, does not carry this kinship connotation. But paradoxically, it made this new relationship actually preferable uh, if you just look at the burdens <laughs> that you have to, to, to care for the uh, other side's uh, parents and so on. So um, it's um, equal rights, uh, slightly better privilege, I guess, <laughs> for, for, for this kind of new relationships. And that's why we said, okay, so uh, we actually have legalized marriage equality. Uh, the the bylaws uh, are exactly the same or slightly better, but the in-laws, as in father-in-law, mother-in-law, we didn't legalize that. So uh, we legalized the bylaws without touching the in-laws. And then the conservative people um, who uh, are, after all, respecting their lineage, uh, the in-law relationship, uh, I wouldn't yeah. say they're happy, 
but they live with it. They they can live with it, and that's how we get marriage equality uh, across the board. And people love that. It's it's amazing because two days ago I was watching Vladimir Putin give this speech and behind him there's these big big missiles and like he's a man standing in front of these big missiles mm -hmm. as if he needed to stand him and I thought how insecure a man should be to put mm -hmm. these big giant missile as you give mm -hmm. a speech and I think somebody was tweeting all over the you know the internet like how insecure a man that mm -hmm. he needs a huge missile and I remember the you know the joke between uh, Kim Jong Un and, and Donald Trump my missiles are big bigger than mm -hmm. your missiles and I thought. These people, these are the same people who want to use majority rule to control minorities and excluding them from any benefits, basically. You know, exclusion from benefits, but control your life. What you're suggesting is the other way around. Sharing the privileges mm -hmm. without control of your life. Mm -hmm. Live a life that is free enough, tolerant of others and respectful of of the the and basically tolerating and embracing and respecting all of others so and and that's that i could see clearly through covid i mean the management of the crisis in taiwan made taiwan and obviously australia a mm -hmm. leader mm -hmm. and you played a major role in that success mm -hmm. can you tell us please more about that you know if you would say what are the main point of success that made taiwan an example of success unlike other countries around you mm -hmm. Well, so far in the country of 24 million, uh, there's less than 1,000 people dead uh, of COVID. Uh, we've never had a single day of lockdown, uh, and the economy uh, has prospered uh, during the COVID. Uh, actually, the, the only one uh, around our region that prospered uh, in all these years. Um, and so that probably counts as success. Uh, and uh, the main reason why is that we trust the citizens. The citizens come up uh, with good ideas, uh, and then we amplify those ideas. It's not anything top down because in the COVID um, virus mutates so quickly. There's no expert panel that can actually catch up. You have to rely on the collective intelligence. You have to rely on ten year old boy that called this toll free number one nine two two and met with someone full of empathy at the call center staffed uh, by the very charities that help people uh, on the earthquakes and so on, uh, who listened to the young boy who said, uh, you're rationing out mask, which is great, but all the boys in my class got blue ones, but I got pink ones. I don't want to wear pink to school. I don't want to wear a mask now. I do something about it. Uh, and then the very next day, 24 hours later, uh, the next 2 p.m., uh, Minister Chen Shizhong, along with all the medical officers, wore pink. Uh, and uh, Minister Chen, he even said that Pink Panther was his childhood hero. Uh, so pink became the color of heroes, uh, and heroes' heroes, I guess. Uh, and then uh, all the fashion brands uh, really just turned pink so for, for quite a few weeks. Uh, and so then after that, the mask adoption rate went like skyrocket because suddenly mask become a way to express yourself. It's not just a way to, uh, to signal that uh, you, you know, protect your own mouth against your own unwashed hands, uh, which is very practical. Uh, but after that, people wear intentionally a rainbow mask or whatever mask uh, as a sign of expression. And that's uh, undoubtedly fought off uh, the original strain, the 2020 strain of the coronavirus. So basically you relied on trusting citizen mm -hmm. citizens mm -hmm. and social responsibility mm -hmm. that you gave them enough trust that you knew that they would protect themselves and mm -hmm. each other mm -hmm. basically that was the formula yeah uh, of course uh, and then uh, refrain from doing <coughs> the sorry <coughs> refrain from doing the um top down um shutdown takedowns lockdowns <coughs> because the the first time you do such a top down lockdown thing uh, it actually decimates, uh, it reduced by 10% uh, the agency of the people. And then people would not want uh, to think of new measures when they know those measures may be uh, turned around and canceled anytime uh, if the jurisdiction leaders uh, feel like it, right? But uh, because we very clearly said in the very beginning that we trust the citizens. So they see their new ways of visualizing mass distribution, of visualizing vaccine distribution, of reminding each other to wear a mask, of contact tracing, uh, all all these essential services, which in other jurisdictions are either built by the government's technology units or by Google and Apple and then translated by the government, 
here in Taiwan is built by GovZero, G0V, the, the civic technologists uh, that design with privacy, with care, with caring about people who don't use a smartphone, people who don't use a phone at all, and so on, uh, people who care about uh, how they want to reverse audits the contact tracer accessing their records and so on to hold them into account, people who care that this must never be used for advertisement or criminal investigation, and so on. So it's designed with democracy baked in, it's not bolted on. And so when the democracy technologists design such systems, the, the state just take a step back and then we say, yeah, we amplify those very good ideas and trusting your citizens pay dividends in situations like the coronavirus where the experts in the government could not possibly catch up uh, as quickly as the virus mutation. So you see with the coronavirus, for example, you can see next door your neighbors. I mean, you see what's happening in Shanghai and it's mm -hmm. just where people are committing suicide. The lockdown is becoming even, seems like a police state in, in, a, in a reality where this is the wealthiest city and yet their wealth didn't matter but because what matter it became like a regime like it's it, it was always a regime but it slipped totally into an authoritarian rule that became so oppressive Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's, yeah. And the thing is that there are civic technologists in Shanghai. They have some of the most brilliant internet entrepreneurs. And some of them did help. Some of them did create the kind of dashboards uh, for people to help each other, to visualize the, the rationing of goods and so on, exactly as the Taiwanese people did in 2020. The difference is that the Beijing regime and the Shanghai uh, government shut those websites down. Right? So they, they would not allow the civic technologist to gain legitimacy through this kind of democratic uh, self-help assembly and so on. And that's the crucial difference. So they shot themselves in the foot and now they have to run uh, from one crisis to another because they could not trust their and empower their citizens mm -hmm. to, to help them solve the issue. I mean, mm -hmm. unbelievable. You know, in Italy, for example, which is a democratic country, but there is a huge movement that was anti-vax. Mm -hmm. There is a huge propaganda that that basically exploited all those rules about lockdown and COVID to instill um, distrust from government. Mm -hmm. And then there, you have people protesting in the street saying, mm -hmm. this is a dictatorship. I don't want lockdown. I don't want the vaccine. I don't want anything because there was a deep distrust of democracy. Your model shows actually a democratic country, an autocratic country, what can work best. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and, so uh, instead of democracy backsliding, all you need is more democracy. Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, and, and regarding democracy, I know, and tell me if it's right, but I read somewhere that on Wednesday, your office is open to the public mm -hmm. from 10 to 10, mm -hmm. 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Mm -hmm. And anyone who have any proposal for you mm -hmm. or for the government, regardless of age, occupation, social status, can come and discuss it. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Uh, that's right. But it needs to uh, fit one of the sustainable demand goals. That is to say, it needs to be a public good. Uh, if they come and say that they, they want to, I don't know, want, want me to... to uh, Lend, lend them some money or something uh, that, like purely personal <laughs> requests that that wouldn't work. Uh, so yes, uh, all the social innovators as defined by people innovating uh, to a public good uh, conforming to the global goals uh, is eligible. Uh, how do you feel about the fact that you're uh, in 2016, obviously became a minister. You're the only in the world that identify as transgender. Mm -hmm. I mean, 2020, you have Petra, mm -hmm. the suitor, yes. but in the whole world, we have only mm -hmm. two people. How is that possible in the 21st century? Mm -hmm. And how? what kind of responsibility this puts on your children? Well, I, I think I, I always am the first openly transgender minister, because for all we know, everybody else may be transgender, which is not open <laughs> about it. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Yeah. Uh, and and, and that's, that's my intersectional view, right? And I, I'm sure that when Minister Chen Shizhong put on the pink mask, he became a little bit more transgender. Right? Yes. He, he defied the, the mainstreaming uh, stereotypes and so on. Uh, and, and so I think this is not a, a binary thing, right? Uh, this non-binary th 
this non-binary thing is not itself binary, right? It's not you're binary or you're non-binary. Uh, everybody can become a little bit more non-binary. And uh, what, what I'm uh, trying to say is that uh, around the world, we're, we're seeing people embracing a different kind of doing politics instead of politicians being someone who is at a distance from the people, uh, the traditional ideas of leadership across uh, radio, television, and persona, and so on. Uh, nowadays, in democratic countries, people are looking for uh, politicians that interact with them uh, in real time, and so that their ideas can amplify through uh, this um, politician. So I call myself a poetician uh, because I, I take good ideas and I write poems about it uh, and contribute to the art world uh, by really questioning my copyrights into the comments. So there's also people in Japan that remix our interviews like this one with a journalist uh, into rap songs and things like that, right? So I think one can be non-binary, not just in gender, uh, but in the kind of work that you do. Uh, whenever people stereotype us as someone who work for the government or for the civic movement and so on, I'm like, uh, why not both? So I think this is a, a wider phenomena that we're seeing around the world, uh, that it's not this or that, this is this and that. And I believe gender is just one of the dimensions uh, that this more inclusive uh, ideas can take hold. And my final question, uh -huh. uh, you you talked about in government and civil society and, and, and uh, obviously your identity and all of it. We are looking at all these big tech giants, whether Apple or Twitter or, or like mm -hmm. Google, all of these guys. Mm -hmm. And I know you consulted with Apple and you mm -hmm. were involved in a high level, the artificial mm -hmm. intelligence projects and also in the development of Siri. Mm -hmm. But we're seeing less and less transparency from these these groups and more, uh, how can I say, hijacking of certain of certain platforms. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, regimes are exploiting Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the commercial model to tell them, okay, we will sell you money, but you sell us basically the secrets so we can monitor, spy on our citizen, etc. How can we make uh, or make these platforms and these companies more socially responsible mm -hmm. or, or force them to become socially responsible? Yeah. Um, I think there's two things going on here. Uh, one is, as you said, uh, surveillance capitalism, right? There are large companies that's, whose only business model is to uh, sell the attention of their users yeah. uh, to the highest bidder, and they want to turn their users into users in the drug industry sense, right? right. Uh, addicts, right? So selling uh, manufactured addiction. So that's that's one problem. I, I don't think Siri does that, but uh, I am not uh, working for Apple anymore. So I don't know, right? So uh, during the time that I work with Apple, uh, one of the, the things that we don't do uh, is things like this, right? So uh, people pay for the service or product upfront, and then uh, whatever face ID or things uh, that you uh, give to the device, stay on the device. It's supposed to be personal computer as in personal to you. Of course, um, I've not worked with Apple for many years. I, I, I don't know, right? Uh, but uh, I think uh, some, some ethics like that in the business model that those companies do uh, need to be identified uh, as socially acceptable patterns. And the socially unacceptable pa patterns need to be identified as such as dark patterns. Uh, and then treat it exactly the same way that we treat other addictive substances. Uh, I often compare, and I'll just call out Facebook, uh, as a, a nightclub uh, where people, of course, people can be socially in a nightclub, uh, but uh, they have to shout uh, to be heard. It's very loud. Noise fills the room. Actually, smoke fills the room too. Addictive uh, smoke at that. And uh, addictive drinks being served, private bouncers uh, escorting you out, uh, and so on. So, so all these uh, are the norm of the entertainment sector within that particular nightclub, maybe with some gambling uh, on the side, uh, but we don't do our town halls in those places. So uh, if a mayor uh, say, oh, let's have a town hall, let's have a conversation uh, to set uh, the social expectation, our new development and so on, uh, on how to be more inclusive, and then they choose the local nightclub uh, as the place to have a deliberation, well, you won't have a deliberation. Uh, you will be uh, having a polarization, a very rousy uh, shouting match, right? Uh, so which is why the city governments invest 
in places like town halls are public libraries, museums, parks, and so on. Those uh, public infrastructures that is worth people's investment to maintain, exactly because we want pro-social, social conversations around social issues in those places. So that brings me to my second point. In addition to identifying the dark patterns and uh, do social sanctions, just, you know, stop using those patterns, calling uh, that out, uh, boycotting them. Uh, we also need pro-social alternatives that is maintained by the pro-social uh, purpose-oriented communities, the social innovators. The state may prototype some of it, but we must also embrace the open API, open source, and open data ethics. So when the social sector can do better, we can just take a step back and say, okay, now the, the Wikipedia community runs our public library better. Maybe we don't bother running a state-sponsored public uh, library, but we also want um, this curational oversight by our democratic elected panels on how the cultures are being misrepresented or represented on the Wikipedia uh, community and so on. So a, a more friendly relationship. And I call this a people-public-private partnership where the people sets the agenda, the norm, the public sector amplify it, and the private sector must conform to the agenda that is set by the people. Amazing. So they need rules and they need to respect those rules. So you're one of the few people that really is engaged on the far front in, in changing the world and making it more transparent, democracy that protects actually the citizenry mm -hmm. and, and not works against mm -hmm. it. If you have to identify your inspirational leaders, mm -hmm. who would you identify? Mm -hmm. Who would you point out in the past or mm -hmm. present? Oh yeah, definitely the, the internet uh, community. That's my first and foremost uh, inspiration, the early internet pioneers. Uh, and uh, nowadays all the people who are connected uh, to the internet. I'm also inspired by people who are not yet connected to the internet, whose voice are not yet heard. Uh, but the community leaders uh, that uh, give them voice, that unmute themselves, uh, that shares uh, the voice that is enabled by the internet. So I'm thinking of uh, the kind of peer-to-peer -peer, um, networks uh, that is started as grassroots in communication, especially in disaster areas, but also in places suffering censorship because the internet uh, become a censorship tool uh, by their authoritarian regimes. And there are people uh, who uh, are working on the protocols and so on to protect the anonymity of the journalistic sources, indeed the communication of journalists themselves, uh, and then enable the people whose voice was either taken away or not yet taken care of by the internet community and connect them uh, to the, as I mentioned, the global organization of movements, not the global organization of the big corporations that wants to set the norm through code or through data. We want um, the people who set the norms locally and then amplify those norms so that we can produce code and data that is actually a service of those norms. I love it. I am so grateful, but mm -hmm. is there anything else I, I skipped? Forgive me if there's mm -hmm. anything else that we did not touch mm -hmm. upon. Mm -hmm. Well, everything, but I think this is a beginning of a conversation. Uh, and uh, uh, just for the record, for the transparent record, uh, uh, we'll make a transcript and feel free to co-edit uh, for 10 days. Uh, and then we, we publish. Uh, but I understand that uh, my nonverbal expressions, uh, you want to publish on a later date, which is fine. I can do an embargo. Uh, so if you publish the video later on, uh, then I publish the video on my side with just my image, no, you but can also publish, your voice. Publish it already. What I what mm -hmm. I will do is, as I told Alessandra, mm -hmm. um, the three things I will do. Mm -hmm. uh, Alessandra will use it to send it, I believe, to some uh, people in Hollywood mm -hmm. because I think there is a really interested in in uh, mm -hmm. in making a feature movie about you, okay. which I absolutely would think is important for America, it's important for the world, mm -hmm. for our next generation, and above all, it's a story that will inspire the world. I have no doubt about it. Uh, whatever, the, after you publish the video, I'd love to publish it as well, once you give me the permission. Mm -hmm. And I would love also, because I'm writing this book about women and human who are transforming the world, changing mm -hmm. the world, mm -hmm. rebels, I call mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. And those rebels are women and transgender, obviously. Mm -hmm. But for me, you are one of my rebels who are mm -hmm. transforming the world. I have no doubt about that. Um, you are my mm -hmm. third interview in that. The first was 
uh, President Eileen Johnson of Liberia, who ended the civil war mm -hmm. and used sex strike, mm -hmm. uh, she and Lima Gibodi to basically to create a movement where they mobilized, galvanized, organized, ended the civil war and elected the first woman African president. And I love her story. I think it's, it's incredible. And, um, and obviously you're, you're, you're one of those amazing rebels mm -hmm. who are changing our world. So mm -hmm. it will be included in, in this book that will come out, you know, in a couple of months. That's excellent. So permission is hereby given. Uh, okay. <laughs> right, so uh, I'll paste you the YouTube link. Uh, I'll uh, put creative comments on it. Uh, so just do whatever. Absolutely, with great pleasure. I thank you so much. And please know that you have allies in the United States mm -hmm. and you have people in the media that whenever you ever need to promote anything in the media, you have um, real allies who believe in your mission mm -hmm. and would love to import some of the tools to the rest of the world, especially for the people who have no voice, the people who are crushed under dictatorship. So thank you. Thank you. Um, and let's work on this together. Live long and prosper. Bye. Yes, 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 absolutely. And if you don't mind, I will send you my movie. And, and uh, I made a movie. I wrote it and it was released. And it's about uh, women in war zones, but how they can thrive regardless. Because mm -hmm. one of them raised me and built an orphanage for children and built a school and a, a university mm -hmm. and raised thousands of girls. So I'll send you the movie. It would be my honor to watch it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. And please thank your assistant. She was so grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.